Amen. Just remembered our veterans uh, Remembrance Day. We had a little bit of a Remembrance Day service here last week, and Craig uh, played a lovely uh, bit of trumpet there. Right? Yes, Thank you. And, uh, of course, so the Remembrance Day services, which were held all throughout our land and much of our world, uh, the Western world anyway, uh, are generally kind of fronted or, or um, initiated by the veterans, right? By, by the legion, the local legions. And, and the legions came into being, as I understand it, someone may correct me, kind of shortly after the Second World War, uh, when a lot of the veterans, you know, kind of decided they needed to keep getting together. Because, I mean, we, those of us that have not been to war, <laughs> we, we just hear about it. But it, it's, it's a, a horror, but it, it, people that have gone to war together are bound together by that experience. And it, you probably heard many of these stories. My father-in-law was... Uh, uh, a soldier in the war, and he did, he wouldn't talk about the war with his family, but you know they would talk about it with their buds, with the, the others that have gone through the same thing. So so there's a, there's this intense camaraderie that comes about through uh, through sharing and that even traumatic experience that they went through, uh, and you know you, you, this gets carried forward. There's a big story in in human in human affairs. Uh, some of you may watch some of the shows I watch on TV, which you may or may not watch. Well, think I should. I don't care. I watch many. <laughs> SEAL Team. SEAL Team is about a, a special ops, an American special ops. There's about six, six guys that uh, go in, and, and uh, there's one woman, actually. So uh, they, go, they go to battle all over the world in you know, secret missions. But the camaraderie and the, the, the closeness and the teamwork that they have, it's called the SEAL Team, uh, is, is a big part of that story and how they, uh, they have to work out their inner conflicts as well as they go along. Interesting. SWAT, you may have watched SWAT. But, um, uh, the Dirty Dozen, remember that? Same kind of thing, same kind of thing. All kinds of adventure tales that we love are wonderful because the mission is undertaken by a group or by a team. So in, in English history, for instance, uh, very famous is King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. So it's not just King Arthur, it's King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. So they have a they have a a, a band of uh, of soldiers and they go out on the, their whatever adventures or for instance Robin Hood and his band of merry men, <laughs> right? Uh, what, one that I love and probably most of you know about it is the Fellowship of the Ring by J.R.R. Tolkien. Who's ever heard of the Fellowship of the Ring by J.R.R. Tolkien? <laughs> okay, it's a pretty famous book uh, set of books series. So it's three main books. There's a book called The Hobbit, which you may have heard of too. So it's the introductory book. And then there's this, these three tomes that make up the Fellowship of the Ring. About 20 years ago, they were made into these blockbuster movies, which you've probably heard of. So, um, But the story is basically it's, it's, it's a, a battle against evil done by the Fellowship. So it's not just one guy. The main, the main characters are, the, are the, the weak little hobbits. They're about, I don't know, four feet high with hairy feet. And, you know, they eat a lot. <clears throat> and, and one is designated to, carry, to be the ring carrier. It's Frodo, right? So there's four, in, in, the, in the fellowship, there, I think now, somebody's going to call me on this one, but I think it's four hobbits, a dwarf, an elf, two men, and a wizard. <laughs> and they're, they're the team. They're the fellowship. And they, uh, you know, they, they have to rescue the world, you know, this fantasy world. So I, I love stuff like that. But it, and it was written, T Tolkien is a Christian, so there's a lot of Christian allegory, you know, kind of the battle against uh, good versus evil throughout these books. Um, we just have this strong tendency and inclination towards gathering together, to being in a group, to being on a team. I've loved, you know, some of the best experiences I've had in my life have been, you know, things we, that I did as a team. Like, uh, you know, the mission trips we did a few years ago, and, and fundraising for those, and then going on them, it really brings you in close and, uh, to one another, and it, 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 these experiences are hard, hard to beat. Um, I remember the, the first time I was on a, a trip, a group trip, was back in high school in grade 12, when the, our, our class was allowed to go to New York City on a bus trip. And, and, you know, so, you know, we'd been together for four years by then, pretty much, but that last year, well, we, some of us did grade 13, too. But <laughs> that used to be a thing. You remember that, grade 13? Yeah. So, so grade, in grade 12, 
Uh, so we did all the fundraising again. Fundraising seems to be, you know, it seems to be a pain, but it's, it, it really brings people together, doing car washes and bake-offs and all this kind of stuff. Um, and, uh, and so off we went to New York City. Dale Robinson, who many of you know Dale. I don't, Dale, I don't think Dale watches, but he's, he kind of got Inglesby now. Uh, he was our history teacher at the time, and he and the geography teacher were the chaperones for the trip with this great big gaggle of teens. We stayed in a hotel in downtown Manhattan, and kind of just ran free and wild, as far as I remember. <laughs> a few years later, oh, when we moved back to Halliburton here, I was talking to Dale, and Dale was, yeah, yeah, he said, I really don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> By the grace of God, nobody got lost or hurt or whatever. And, uh, yeah, so <laughs> probably shouldn't have done that, but we did do that, and it was, it was this great sense of camaraderie. So that kind of stuff, and you may have a memory of that or experience of that. A lot of the groups that we belong to are about that. Um, the Church of Jesus is meant to be a profound expression of this very thing. That's what Jesus' plan is, God's plan. is. He built into us this desire, this longing to be together with other people, other human beings, and, and to be part of a mission, part of an adventure. Uh, you know, that's, that's something that he's, he's set into us. And the church is, is meant to be that in a very profound way. And especially because it's something that you're in for life. <laughs> you know, a lot of these other things are like a mission trip might be a few months you get ready for or your, your teen years. I was going to mention, speaking of teens, you know, th this <laughs> inclination to get together. Teenagers are the quintessent example. They're always clustering. We walk in Head Lake Park and Rotary Park a lot. And almost always, there's a, there's a gaggle of teens somewhere around. And they, just, they just can't help but get together all the time. And we're probably thinking, oh, they're up to no good. They probably are. But, <laughs> no, I don't know. The, the main thing, they just, they just want to be together. They want to be with you know, people their age, they, with their friends. It's just this unique uh, human thing. And the church is meant to be a, a, a profound expression of that. It's not just for a year not just for a few months, but for, for life. We're bound together. It's more like a family, really, because you're thrown together and you need to, we, on a mission, which I'll get to, but, and we're called to work out our inter, inter, um, interpersonal relationships all the time. And for, that's why the, all the talk in the Bible is about forgiving and et cetera, et cetera, and on loving. I'll get to that too. So the writer of Hebrews, which is the book that Janice read from, is well aware of this that that's what the church is. I mean, this, we don't even know who the writer of Hebrews was. It's interesting. It's really the only book in the New Testament, maybe in the Bible. Well, no, the Old Testament's kind of similar. It's got some books like that. But in the New Testament, it's the only book that is not credited to anybody in particular. Lots of guesses. Nobody knows. But for sure, this is a person who was part of the early church. And the early church was a very tight-knit tight grip, bunch of people that, that you know, had to bind, bound, had to be, had to, were bound together in this common faith in Jesus Christ. They didn't have church buildings. You know, they were in the minority. They were brand new. And, uh, you know, the, 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 if you want to call the philosophy, the, the perspective they had in the world was totally foreign to the world of their day. You know, this whole idea of loving one another and stuff. <laughs> Taking care of the little children and widows and orphans. What? <laughs> you know, give, putting them in this... Uh, important place. So, so the, their whole way of thinking and w was necessitated them being close and being knit, tight knit. So he was he would be well. I mean, for example, in the book of Acts, you read the book of Acts, and this is a little vignette, a little glimpse of what the early church was, was like. It says in those early days, it says nobody had anything that they called their own, but they all held everything in common. And if anybody had any need, they just they jumped to it. They'd sell stuff in order to supply the needs of those that were, that were wanting. And so on. I mean, it's quite clear. It was this voluntary communalism that was, uh, was the way the early church worked. So, so the writer of Hebrews, whoever that is, was very well aware of this. But he starts, so by the time we get to chapter 10, this is chapter 10 of the book of Hebrews, and it continues in this passage, what mostly he does is he lifts up Jesus. That's the whole book. It's about lifting up Jesus. And the book is called Hebrews because it's kind of directed more at in kind of the Jewish experience or culture, and especially with in, in view of what we call the Old Testament or the, the Hebrew Scriptures, 
and the way that they were, uh, through the Mosaic law, they were, they were approaching God. So the whole pr- the traditions of the priests and the tabernacle and the temple and the sacrifices and all that, and Moses. So for instance, very early in this book, he compares Jesus to Moses. He says, Moses was faithful over the house of God, like a good servant, but Jesus as a son. And just like, you know, the one that serves in the house, which, which is, which is uh, preeminent, the one that serves in the house or the one that built the house? <laughs> but he keeps comparing Jesus to, and, and, the, and, and of course, the sacrifice is, is super important. Um, back in, under the, the, the religious system, every priest stands and performs their religious duties again and again. They offer the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest, I mean, means Jesus, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins on the cross, or the cross, doesn't say the cross here, he just says one sacrifice for sins. He sat down at the right hand of God. Since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool, because by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Now there's a verse for you to chew on. By his one sacrifice, according to the Bible, Jesus has made us perfect forever, who are being sanctified. It almost sounds like he's contradicted himself there. <laughs> if we're perfect, why would we need to be sanctified? So, so, so as Christians, we are called to hold these two things in tension. Uh, so we have been perfected by Christ. That's the core truth of who we are now. And yet we're not perfected yet. <laughs> In some, in another way. I mean, we are being, we're in the process of being transformed into the likeness of Christ, and you know that's a lifelong journey. It's not really going to happen till we get there uh, fully. But it, it is, in another sense, this is the mystery of the gospel, and it's a wonderful truth to lay hold of. Who we are in Christ is we have been. I, I, this is one of the ones I review when I'm feeling like there's something wrong with me, horribly wrong with me, <laughs> feeling the condemnation, if you will, and the guilt and all that. It says. He has made perfect forever those who are being sanctified, made whole. So then we jump to the next section. He continues to uphold Jesus. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, so the, the old holy place was the inside, innermost sanctum, sanctus sanctorum of the, uh, the temple or the taber- tabernacle, they entered by the blood of bulls. So now he contrasts that. He says, by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, opened for us through the curtain, that is his body. So he says, the way to heaven, the Holy of Holies, has been opened up through the curtain, that is the body of Jesus. Now this reminds me, and it may remind you, remember the story, it's an Easter story, of uh, at the crucifixion of Christ, it says, he says, it is finished, and he, he, uh, he gave up his spirit, and the, the curtain of the temple was ripped in two from top to bottom, okay? which, which is meant to signify to us in a physical, dramatic way that the way to God has been opened up through the death of Christ. So whereas only the priest could go once a year into the Holy of Holies, now everybody can come in through faith in Christ and walk right up to the Father's throne. By faith, through grace, not by deeds, not by merit. Uh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, so we have one final you know, great high priest, which is Jesus. Okay, so that's, so I've told you, he, he, he lifts up Jesus and then he talks about who we are and what we're all about t- together. I've called this message together. <laughs> and he's got th- four let us's. I almost called the sermon let us's. But yeah, you know, Craig will make some silly joke and, <laughs> about let us and... And it just wouldn't work. So, so we went with together. <clears throat> and uh, so let us, it, 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 here's a little aside for those of you that want a little aside. So when we, when we don't usually say let us. If, we say, if, if you say to your, your partner, let us go to the store and get some groceries, you don't say, you say let's go to the store. Okay? And even when we say, I don't usually say let us pray. I say let's pray. So, but if you were a... a, a, a from another language group trying to learn English, you could get very confused by this. So for instance, <laughs> if you wanted to say, I'm going to ask dad if he'll let us use the car, and you, you try to put the contraction there, I'm going to ask dad if he'll let's use the car, okay, you can't do that, can you? That's wrong. 
How would you know that if you weren't an English speaker, right? Yeah. Anyway, that has nothing to do with anything. They just, just to see if your brains are still clicking. So there's four lettuces, let's lines here. And the first is this, verse 22, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. He says, let us draw near to God. I'm reading, um, uh, the whole world is, 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 is trying to find God. They don't know it. It's unconscious, but it's there. I'm reading a book by an apologist, and I'll just to say it again, an apologist is not someone that apologizes. They're someone that defends the faith. <laughs> and, uh, and the apologists talk a lot about this, um, that that we have a whole world of people that are hungry for something and they don't know what it is. There's this, Augustine, I don't know his exact words, St. Augustine's, Augustine, you know, had, had this line about, you know, all of us have, have kind of this God-shaped hole <laughs> in our hearts. And it isn't satisfied until God gets plugged in there. I mean, he made us that way. He made us for himself, and we're not happy and not satisfied until we connect with him. So the whole world is longing for something, and, you know, the... They want meaning and they want, you know, they long for eternity, but they're struggling to, to find it. They're trying to, trying in every, every way, shape, and fashion, you know, making buck, bucks of money, getting entertained, <laughs> eating and drinking, whatever. All, all of which, much of which is fine and good, but you can never actually satisfy yourself. Mick Jagger had it down, he's, he's like the voice over the, uh, Mick Jagger of the Rolling Stones. He's like the voice of this. I can't get no satisfaction. <laughs> And he, you know, he speaks for humanity. And, uh, but in Christ, we have satisfaction. When you c- connect with Jesus Christ, your deepest need, need is met. Your, your sins are washed away and you're connected with your maker, your God, your creator, which is what you're meant to do and meant to, how you're meant to be. And so it's like a, you've come home. It's like the prodigal son that comes back to the father and he's come home. So that being the case... Let us draw near to God. We have the privilege of doing that now. We can go to God with our problems and our concerns and our thanksgivings, you know, and our praises. So this is about worship and this is about prayer. But he's, he's saying with all this in place and with this, this, this one who is at the center of our lives, who is beyond our imaginingly, you know, uh, beyond our imaginings, <laughs> great and wonderful and, and amazing, let's, let's draw near. With a, full, with, with a sincere heart, in full assurance of faith. So we don't come by any means, but by our faith, by, by trusting him. So that's, that's point one. Two, <laughs> verse 23. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. Let us hold unswervingly. Great word, eh? Unswervingly. Because I don't know, I, I was just... I've been up and down County Road 1 a few times this week. I don't know if you've been down County Road 1, but it's got fresh pavement. It's just down by Melissa's place there. There's these black tire marks that are just all over the road where somebody's burned rubber. You seen that? Yeah, yeah. That's called swerving. <laughs> I don't know whether it was a deer. I don't know whether they were drunk. Well, I, actually, I heard who it was, and I know they're not heavy drinkers, so that's not what it was. <laughs> that Lachlan, they knew who that was. <laughs> they knew who it was. It's Lachlan people, and they know things. So it wasn't Melissa. I would have said that if it wasn't. But, uh, yeah, so, so, so that's the opposite of what he's talking about here. So, so keeping it between the lines. Hope, he says, uh, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. Now, the hope, when the, when the New Testament uses the word hope, it's almost always talking about what is yet to come. Hope is, is that which we're sure of, but hasn't happened yet. It's not, a, it's not, as I've said before, it's not that our hope that the Maple Leafs, sorry, that the Maple Leafs are going to win the Stanley Cup this year, because that's a yeah, nebulous hope at best. This is a for sure hope, and, uh, you know, it, it's rock salt. But it hasn't happened yet, so it's called hope. And he says, but we can hold unswervingly to this hope that we are, we are going to heaven, that we're going to live forever, that we're going to see Jesus, that we're going to be with God, that sin and suffering and sorrow and sickness is all going to be gone forever. And forever will be there. And it will get better forever and ever. Hard for us to even imagine. 
but it's our hope. And he says, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. The reason we hope for it is because God has promised it to us. And he never breaks his promises. And he says, for God so loved the world, he gave his only son. Whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. It's a promise. And many, many other such are throughout scripture. And the Holy Spirit brings that home to our hearts. So he says, listen, don't, don't, don't run all over the road with that one. Just hang on to that one. <laughs> Straight ahead. Now we get down to some a bit more nitty-gritty in verse 24 here. Uh, it's all nitty-gritty, but this, this gets on to the, the practicalities of our day-to-day -day life. And let us consider, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. So he says, spend some time thinking about this. How am I going to churn other people up to doing good works and help I mean, I got it that easy because I, I get to talk and rant at people. <laughs> but but he, this is a calling for all of us to figure out ways in which we are to stir one another up. The word in the, the, word in the original is, um, is, it's translated here, spur. And you, you remember, what, you know what a spur is? Where you dig it into the horse, I got spurs, that jingle, jingle, jingle. <laughs> and it probably is a little unpleasant. And it's, this word's got that hint of it. So if we're going to spur one another up, we may actually be provoking each other just a, just a teeny little bit. Just, you know, taking people out of their comfort zones, perhaps. Taking one another out. And the word in the, uh, the, word in the Greek is paroxysm. <laughs> you know what, you ever heard the word paroxysm? The so paroxysm is like where you're jo you have this kind of emotional shock and you're almost like shaken and, you know, you're having a paroxysm. And that's from this Greek word that's used in this passage. So it's maybe not the most comfortable idea. It's the sense that, you know, we're provoking, we're inciting one another to, good, to love and good works. And this is, uh, so this is one of those many, many, many instances, incidents of, uh, of this idea of one another, which is all through the New Testament. I got this, if you, you might want me to get you one of these, the one another passages. And uh, this, this scholar has found 59 in, in the New Testament books, where we're instructed to do something to one another. <laughs> Mostly good things, except for things like do not lie to one another, you know. And, uh, but mostly it's love one another, be devoted to one another, honor one another above yourselves, live in harmony with one another, build up one another, be like-minded towards one another, accept one another, admonish one another, care for one another, serve one another, bear one another, birds, forgive one another, <laughs> etc. 59. And this is two of them. Two of them are in this passage, actually. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's basically the thrust, that we're to, to kind of stir each other up. And then 25, the last one of this group, the set, let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Because this one's, you know, pr pretty timely. <laughs> Since we've been prevented, almost, from getting together to meet one another, and this is why there's been tension in the church. And, and people in, in churches have, have said, you know, we've got to get together. It says in the Bible, right? And, and yet the government's saying you've got to stay apart. So and that, that tension has been there, and so it, which has been difficult for us because we are meant to be an incarnational people. At the core of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that God became human. He incarnated, and he came to earth and walked among us as one of us and rubbed elbows with us and, you know, hugged us and... Uh, touched us and suffered and, you know, slept and died physically, incarnationally. And the church is meant to be that. We're meant to be in the embodiment of God. We're, we're Jesus' body on earth. And, and so we're meant to be incarnational. And he says a, a lot of people, he says a lot of people, uh, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing even in the early days of the church, people were giving up getting back together. And that's what's going on today. I mean, we live in a world where people kind of, there's a lot of forces that push people away from meeting together, i.e. church. Things like, you know, I'm, I've got, if you were to do a survey, you'd find a huge, enormous proportion of the Canadian population considers themselves to be Christians. But only a very small part, portion of that actually meet together and go to churches. And they'll say, you know, some things like, well, I've got, it's, a, it's an individual thing. It's, my, it's just my, my private life. 
And the, and, uh, the church of Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ, is about community living. It is about a, an individual faith, but it's very much about uh, being a society or an assembly of people who follow Jesus, who belong to Jesus. So, so uh, we've got to be careful there, he says. And, and, and I do not wish to decry or deny or deride in any way those who are watching virtually, because, you know, a lot of us have done that. I, I, I think this has been literally the, the ability to stream our services. I would say this has been a godsend. And it's wonderful how timely it's been. At this time in the history of the human race, when this pandemic has hit us, which is very bizarre, and has pushed us apart in so many strange ways uh, and kept us from each other, at the very same time, the technology has been available for the first time in history where we can actually connect with each other uh, you know, through this kind of uh, medium. So it's interesting. So to me, it's a godsend. But we have to remember that it is virtual and not truly incarnational and therefore not as good. I don't, I, I'm tiptoeing here a little bit because <laughs> I really appreciate it. And I think we'll be doing this forever now because it's just the way, one way to connect. Because uh, at the same time, many people do not yet feel safe. Fair enough, right? Nobody has sounded the all clear. We're all wearing masks, pretty much. You know? So um, the virtual way also helps us to keep in touch over long distances. So there's, there's so much to be said for it. But, uh, you know, nevertheless, we need to work according to Scripture here, uh, according to the Holy Spirit, at keeping connected, being together, and being careful we don't substitute the virtual for the real. So we have to, all of us have to work through, you know, where our boundaries lie. And not, it, it, we are creatures of habit, we humans. So if you have a habit of going to church, you're inclined to go to church. But if for a year and a half we stop going to church, guess what? <laughs> we, we have a little bit of, uh, what's that, the opposite of momentum, inertia. Uh, and, uh, you know, so we, we may not be inclined to go back. So we want to be careful about that. Uh, we're on a mission to know Christ and to make him known because our world is literally quite lost without him and in need of him. But we need each other to fulfill that mission. And it only works when we do it together. Let's pray.